So what's the background to it? First of all, the financial crisis and the Lehman Brothers failure, plus the failure of a whole host of other banks uh, in, in the US and in the UK and in Ireland and indeed Iceland <laughs> uh, and in and other countries in Northern Europe, one or two countries in Northern Europe, uh, showed us that uh, financial ba institutions, banks did not necessarily have uh, viable contingencies in place in, to enable them that they could follow to enable them to recover from a severe shock event, which is what we observed uh, between from 2007 through to the beginning of 2009. And once they did fail, uh, there wasn't a, 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 a pro, uh, process to wind down the firm in an orderly manner. The Lehman Brothers uh, unwind after its bankruptcy took over 10 years. Um, not a surprise. It was probably the most complex institution that could have gone bust ever amongst banks. Uh, more than a thousand different SPVs around the world that they had to unwind as part of the Lehman's group. Uh, but it took over 10 years to, to wind down in an orderly manner. And it was a very complex institution. So as a result of that, Regulatory authorities required first a contingency plan, which we're now going to call a recovery plan, and secondly a resolution plan, which is the the, the gone concern, the failed bank unwinding scenario. Okay, uh, originally they, they were known as recovery and resolution plans, uh, one document. But subsequent to that, in some jurisdictions, they've been split. It makes a lot of sense to split them, in my personal opinion, uh, because they are different. They are different conceptually. The recovery plan is, as its name suggests, a going concern document. It's still, uh, it, the bank is still a going concern, or at least potentially so, once it implements what's in the recovery plan. On the other hand, a resolution plan is a gone concern document. The bank is no longer survivable in its current form, so it needs to be unwound. And there's three different resolution solutions possible under regulatory in the supervision rules. But as I said, not our concern this evening. We're not going to 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 cover it okay now in in some jurisdictions it's the same supervision supervision authority for all of this in other jurisdictions like for example the us you've got more than one uh, a, a regulatory or federal authority that is involved in overseeing the process okay the living will that's the resolution plan um again something that enabled to describe how the bank would unwind itself that is that slide five is just retained for your reference. We don't need to consider it for BTRM purposes. Uh, again, in the UK, in the European Union, uh, there was the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive in 2014, subsequently updated. There is a BRRD2. OK, have a look at the reading list for the reference to that one. That that is the, the European Union's guidance or rules on recovery and resolution planning. OK. Uh, and uh, so depending on which jurisdiction in, you are in, you will want to be familiar with the recovery planning guidance and the resolution planning guidance in your in your jurisdiction. Now, what was the recovery plan? The recovery plan was uh, something that was a, a, a detailed document that would that would uh, a, that would consider a range of stress scenarios under the hypothesis that these stress scenarios one at a time actually took place, how would you recover from them? Hence, recovery option. Now, you're going to look at ICAP and ILAP in module four and module five. So these lectures are yet to come. And when you get familiar with them, you might think, it seems to me that the recovery plan is an extension of what's in the ICAP and the ILAP, you know, consideration of a stress scenario, you model the impact on the balance sheet and you say, here is how I would recover from these stress scenarios using this capital and liquidity resource that I have in place. That's, an, that's a summary of an ICAP and an ILAP really, capital and liquidity adequacy assessment. The recovery plan from a working perspective can be viewed as an extension of that, okay? You consider three scenarios and you describe how you would recover from them. But of course, these are more severe scenarios. I say, of course, because the idea is they are so severe, the bank needs to implement recovery options to recover from them. So they go beyond, um, certainly in their extreme, in their extremity, they go beyond what you would have in an ICAP and an ILAP. OK, so that's what the recovery plan is in a nutshell. Um, the recovery plan should further include what would trigger it. That's what that first bullet point there says. Breaches of quantitative or qualitative recovery triggers signaling that the bank is experiencing financial stress. So in other words, you've got 
a range of trigger indicators that if you if they go over a certain level which is pre-specified you are at least theoretically in recovery plan territory now cast your minds back to lecture two on the risk management framework where i showed you a number of key risk indicators some of those will be recovery plan key risk indicators and you would put a trigger level against those indicators and if they tripped that trigger in theory at least that should trigger a conversation at board level on whether the, well certainly at executive level and potentially at board level uh, on whether the bank needs to implement its recovery plan okay so uh, where there is a breach you will consider that's the next bullet point the impact of the scenarios if there's a breach what does this mean for your balance sheet if these in one or more of these risk indicators are in the red zone they've triggered the recovery plan level what does that mean for your balance sheet and then what you will what are you going to do in response to this and the impact just isn't on the balance sheet it's also on your ability to undertake critical operations in other words carry on functioning really remember this is going concern scenario you still have to carry on doing what you are doing on a daily basis dealing with the market and your customers uh, while you are in recovery uh, in Europe institutions must submit the recovery plans at least annually it's a European Union directive it's not the same in every country around the world um, the ECB obviously directly supervises systemically important banks in the EU um, which is what slide nine is talking about um, in some jurisdictions only the designated large systemically important banks designated as such by their supervision authority would submit an annual recovery plan i've been lecturing uh, around the world um you know in well certainly since the crash well before the crash as a matter of interest <laughs> but also uh, subsequent to the crash and uh, i noticed that when i'm in certain countries in the middle east in 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 africa in in asia in east asia southeast asia um uh, not uh, every institution needs to submit a recovery plan okay it's not a universal requirement if you are in a jurisdiction where you are not required to do this, then great. One less regulatory compliance task that you need to to um, to to be compliant with. Uh, but if you are, then of course you'll want to know what your supervision authority uh, requires of you in the recovery plan. So take look at slide nine. What does the ECB require? Um, they're going to look at the, the scenarios, what options are discussed, whether they're credible, how you escalate in a crisis, who's in charge, what the responsibilities are. We're going to look at all that in a bit more detail in a second. Now, slide 10 is there just for your reference. OK, it's resolution planning post failure, but it's just there for your interest. You don't need to 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 consider it. It's not it's not part of the syllabus any longer.